Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast, brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to $9.99 using the code Oxygen Addict. And also a bit of advance notice that over Black Friday weekend, the code Oxygen Friday will be good for 20% off everything in store on PrecisionHydration.com. So that's from Friday the 23rd of November through till midnight Cyber Monday on the 26th of November. Now, we're also brought to you by TeamOxygenAddict.com Triathlon Coaching. Official coaching partner to the Outlaw Series, training plans, coaching support from your host Rob Wilby, monthly video coaching calls and a private Facebook group for you and your teammates. And you can also join our free Oxygen Addict Triathlon Community Facebook page. Just uh, look that up on Facebook and join that. Loads of great triathlon chat going up. Hells, we are now over 900 members in that group. That's awesome, isn't it? Over nine, wow, yeah, that's that's grown very quickly. It certainly has, yeah. That's four weeks, I think we've been doing that for now. Maybe even, maybe five, I'm not sure. But yeah, 900 people, that's brill. So pop in there, say hi, have a bit of chat, ask your training questions. It's all good. And uh, yeah, exciting news about being official coaching partner to the Outlaw Hells. That, so what what's that going to mean, Rob? What does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to be doing some training articles for them. We're going to be doing some free webinars for people doing the Outlaw. So anything, any of the Outlaw half events or the Outlaw full, if you want to know about your training, we're going to be doing some, initially it's going to be webinars actually, but I'm also going to be writing some articles for people in the run up for that. So the first one's happening this week. It's going to be a kind of how to train over winter if you're doing half Outlaw or full Outlaw next summer type deal. So yeah, exciting stuff. It's a, it's a it's a such a great race, and I know like Nottingham sold out, didn't it? The Nottingham half sold out very very quickly as is, yeah. as usual. Yeah. Still probably places on the full. That's right. Yeah. So get yourself over there, and uh, if you're looking for a race, we loved it, didn't we? This this summer, despite the weather, we loved it. The summer, <laughs> the the monsoon summer, the the day in Nottingham whereby it just like threw it down completely. Good yeah, we were there, didn't surfer. we? We did the um, the relay at the Outlaw full and then a couple of years ago i did the uh outlaw half and yeah cracking race brilliant stuff ace so uh what have you been up to hells what's new with you what's been going on this week oh well there was no crazy wedding in the middle of it this week uh, i went to the training peaks endurance conference summit endurance summit um, which was in manchester last week they had a couple of days they had the training peaks university as well i just went for one day the first day and yeah there were a lot of endurance enthusiasts in one room it was really yeah really really good to just meet lots of different people lots of different coaches um and experts within the field i guess yeah all manner of experts were there and because of a short of them they asked me along (laughs) (laughs) i didn't see you talk but i i saw um like sports psychologists nutritionists uh, strength and conditioning experts, bike fitters. It was a total array of different people, different areas. They had like workshops on running mechanics. Um, they had loads of stuff. They had panels about, you know, how to make the most of your time, et cetera, et cetera. What were you talking about? It was, well, first up, I've never been to the Etihad Stadium before. And what an amazing venue for conferencing that is, isn't it? It was totally inspiring. Was it? Yeah, the the whole sort of like the glass backed thing, and it just I loved the whole place. I thought it was amazing. I always think it's very so. I I have been there before for a different event, but um, the first time or my first sort of the start of my relationship with the Etihad Stadium would have been back in two thousand and two, Rob, when of course it was the stadium for the Manchester uh, Commonwealth Games. Okay, yeah. And and then they and you sort of think I, I I was standing outside the other day thinking I cannot even picture how this was during yeah. the Commonwealth Games I I couldn't rewind my head back to it um and I just, but I remember at the time of the Commonwealth Games you know there would have been one part of the stand or the stadium which didn't have a roof or anything like that and then they would have had to have like dug down and like put in loads and loads of seats and it's just amazing now isn't it as well how massive manchester city have grown as well sort yeah. of other football team yeah um and then yeah it's it, it was funny because there were people from all around the world and so 
for them for the first time being the there, probably a bit you like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it is, it is one of those places whereby the first time you sort of see it or you step in or whatever, you're like, wow, this is quite impressive. Oh, yeah, it was. I, I was exactly like that. I was walking in, looking around and thinking, this place is totally amazing. And also when you're, you know, you're surrounded by like Joe Friel's there and Dirk Friel and the whole team from Training Peaks and fair play to them. They put on, I thought was a, a brilliant conference, loads of really interesting speakers. And I think what amazed me was a number of people who had flown in for it from all around the world, from all over Europe and even from America and Canada. So um, they've done a, they've done an amazing job of putting that together. So if anyone's listening and is on a coaching journey and wants to sort of learn more about that, I'd highly recommend that. And they mentioned that they might be back in a couple of years time. I think they're going to be back in America for the conference next year, but they said they'll be coming back to, uh, to Manchester maybe the year after. So fingers crossed for that. But yeah, it was ace. I was super nervous giving a talk. I tell you what. <laughs> it must have been. Yeah. Yeah, it was good though. Because you realise that you you kind of stand there and go, there's a bit of imposter syndrome where you start thinking, what am I doing here? You know, I'm standing next to Joe Friel. People should be asking him questions. But then you realise that people who are a bit further back along the coaching journey than I am have got questions and they go, well, how have you got from where I am to where you are? And in almost all cases, after we, after we gave the speech, people came up and were like, wow, that's amazing that you've managed to go from having a full-time job in one thing to changing to having a full-time job in coaching. And that's exactly where I want to go. Tell me how you did it. And you go, I can't really do that in 10 seconds. <laughs> Plus I don't want to give away all my secrets. <laughs> I don't know whether there were any secrets. <laughs> no, it was good though. I met loads of really nice, interesting people. Um, yeah, and loved it. It was great. Really cool. I met someone from Winnipeg. I love that. Helped them get their tram tickets for the train home. And he'd, honestly, he had come all the way from Winnipeg in Canada. Wow. Yeah. To be baffled Amazing, by the uh, the Manchester tram system. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's kick off with a bit of uh, a bit of the old results sponsored by Precision Hydration. The guys from Precision Hydration were there at ECS. Um, Andy Blow was there doing a talk about hydration, which was very well received. And they had a stand in the expo and there were loads of people getting the sweat tests done. So a couple of reminders here for you. First up, you can use the code OxygenAddict to get £9.99 worth of free Precision Hydration. Um, also over, Black, over the Black Friday and Cyber Monday that weekend from Friday the 23rd of November through 26th of November this year you can use the code Oxygen Friday. that's going to be good for 20% off everything so good time to get yourself stocked up and if you haven't already done so get over to their website and take the online sweat test that will give you a good lead as to whether you are a particularly heavy or salty sweater and if so they've got all kind of resources there to help you out including being pointed towards their that in-person sweat test so there was loads of that going on at the conference wasn't the hells there was loads of it and they were they were very well positioned in the room when you sort of walk in they were there and they did uh, have it was time really slot didn't they Oh yeah, yeah, it was great to catch up with um, with Dave and Andy and see all all of the team there. Um, and, Brad Williams um, was there as well, actually. Yeah, Brad, Brad I saw, was there I saw Brad on Williams, stand, wasn't he? Yep, had a good chat to had a little chat to Brad. I think we did one of those. Both looked at each other, thinking, "I think I know who you are." Yeah, I'm not. I think so. And then and then I was like, "Are you Brad?" <laughs> and he said, "Are you <laughs> Helen?" <laughs> yes. Hi. <laughs> it's yeah, funny, yeah. isn't it? Because uh, we had Heather Fell from GTN introduce us and. She said to me afterwards, it's really weird this meeting you in person after I've listened to your voice on the podcast. And I was like, it's really weird for me meeting you because I've watched your watched your videos every week. So, yeah, very strange. Oh, I'll tell you what else tells as well. This isn't this isn't related to um, the conference, but I was at the gym yesterday and I bumped into John McAvoy. Really? So same exact thing. I said, excuse me, are you John McAvoy? And he said, yeah, are you Rob from the podcast? I recognize your voice. <laughs> so really strange. He'd been up for, he'd been watching the boxing and he was training in the gym that I'm at. Um, oh. Yeah. So we had a good old chat and he high-fived my little lad, which was really cool. So nice. yeah, interesting to chat with him. He looks that in is good one, shape. 
Oh, I'm sure he does. I was just going to say that is one interview that if you didn't ever hear the interview with John McAvoy, it is a couple of years ago now, I think. But um, honestly, go back and, and listen through. That was, yeah, the, the sort of the main gist of the story does not change at all. Um, fascinating listen. So go back and stick your headphones on, download it. Yeah, I was trying to scroll through here and trying to find the. There we go. Is it? No, it's not that one. Can't find it. Um, yeah, he's a legend, isn't he? Uh, it's got it. Yeah, he's, he's yeah doing good stuff. Oh, that's good stuff. All right. So, um, what were we doing? We were talking about results, weren't we? <laughs> we were. <laughs> All right. So first up, there's not a huge amount of racing going on this weekend. So one thing that we did notice was um, Challenge Shepparton down in Australia. Yes, um, and uh, Levi Maxwell and Annabelle Luxford uh, were the winners there. Loving the blue skies down in Shepparton, Rob. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? When you, you look out the window, it's raining here, and then you see them in the thick of their uh, their race season down there. Oh yeah, just uh, sort of going into going into summer, aren't they? Yeah. So Levi Maxwell, three forty six ahead of Tim Van Berkel, a uh, fellow Australian, and then Matt Slee and Annabelle Luxford, comfortable win there by ten minutes ahead of Grace Thek and uh, Courtney Gilfillan, third. Good, good, good. And a shout out to Team OA member Rich Flarty, who smashed his PB in that race as well. So nice work for him. Disappointingly, Hells, Rich has always had a very, very big, impressive beard and he shaved it off for race day. So I didn't even even recognise the photo of him. Oh. (laughs) He had like a proper, proper massive, like halfway down his chest kind of beard. And it's almost all gone. (laughs) <laughs> wow wow uh, other race results we had um the coedy brennan trail duathlon was on it was last weekend wasn't it yeah just down the road really isn't it or oh, sort of down the road from um where Thoughts, i grew yeah. up yeah um nice it's a it's a good place there to go and hit the mountain bike trails if you are um in northeast wales nice um nice little center there isn't it for for mountain biking that was where i first gave it a go rob and um came off ended up in tears oh no bless you yeah clearly uh so (laughs) full distance in the men's race was won by gavin roberts and in the women's race it was won by michelle bowen and the sprint winners were gwyneth jones in 115 in the men's race and then rianne roxborough who um you often hear she's a really really good athlete you often hear her name at the always aim high events so she took out the women's sprint she did i met her at the conference actually um, ah. she was at a conference she came over and said hi so yeah it was nice to meet her quality athlete yeah honestly she, she's always up there she sure is it's good good sometimes sometimes if Susie Richards might be racing then you know she might be behind Susie but um uh, you know I, I don't want I don't want to say if she's always yeah good good battles so there we go cool all right so listen we'll jump into this week's interview I've got a cracker this week lined up hells. I've got a chap called Michael Erickson on who he recently won the male 25 age group at 70.3 Portugal in what was actually his first 70.3. So despite just having stepped up to the distance and using it as a bit of a tester, he absolutely blitzed it. And I think the listeners will know him. He's also um, he's also got his own podcast. He's got a podcast show called That Triathlon Podcast. So we thought we'd make an interesting interview to have him on. So, yeah, here we go. This week's interview of the week with Michael Erickson. Right. So really pleased to welcome onto the show super duper age grouper, Michael Erickson. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, Rob. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. It's one of the first triathlon podcasts I, I found when I first found out about podcasts overall. No, it's it's great to have you on because obviously a lot of the listeners are going to know you already from that triathlon show, the podcast that you do. But I really wanted to get you on because I think you've got this really interesting story about becoming a top age grouper. And, you know, let's hear the story of how you've gone from working full time outside of triathlon to basically optimizing your life to live the dream, to try and be the best triathlete that you can be. Yeah, uh, totally. And and it's an ongoing process. It's it's not finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for you and me both, man. All right. So so first up, congratulations. I was following results recently. And obviously, you won your age group at 70.3 Portugal in the race. And now, how to pronounce this? Is it Cascais? Is that correct? Uh, Cascais. Cascais. There we go. 
Helen will be shaking her head at my pronunciation, I'm sure, this time. I need her here to keep me on track. So you won your age group in the male 25, and I think you were, now correct me, were you seventh age group overall? Something like that. I'm actually not, not sure on the Something overall like age that. group. So congratulations, man. That's a that's a massive thing to actually get the, the winner's age group trophy at 70.3. And I thought it'd be really interesting to interview you on the basis of that and see what kind of hard work it's taken to get you to that point. So let's jump into your backstory first off. When did you first get into triathlon and and how's it all come about? Yeah, so that was, uh, I actually, growing up, I was playing football from six through 19 years old. And uh, and then I moved to, to Helsinki from a small community, uh, an island actually in the Baltic Sea and started university, uh, studying engineering. And at that time I stopped playing football. Uh, that's uh, soccer for American listeners that I also know that you have. Uh, so, so I just started running recreationally and got into running. I, I had done a marathon before when I was 17, just for fun. A friend of mine did it. I couldn't be uh, worse than him. I was very competitive. So I just did it on off of no training. But then, then over the next couple of years that I just ran recreationally to keep the, the boost weight off a bit, I, I got more <laughs> into running and started enjoying it a bit more and started to get a bit more serious. Nothing super serious. I would never... Uh, were part of any clubs or anything like that but I just had these marathons as goal races and tried to work pretty hard for them and when I was 22 23 I think I started running like almost getting up to like 100 kilometer or 60 mile weeks in my in my marathon build so so got pretty competitive and serious and I did a I think a 250 marathon was my best in the last marathon that I did in 2014 but then I started having injury problems with my knee, and uh, and the, the last time that that injury problem cropped up, I, I saw a lot of different physios and had a long rehab process. But it just took a lot of time, so I started swimming and cycling as a cross training modality, and uh, that was in 2015. And uh, in the spring of 2015, actually, I started. I had done a little bit of road cycling as cross training the years before, not much, just going out on some local group rides and I wasn't any good. I had a 10 year old road bike that I bought for 300 or 400 euros and uh, knew nothing basically. And swimming, same thing. I could, I could swim. It wasn't a problem for me to like cover the distance, but I was very slow, like I think 220, 100 meter pace when I started out, something like that. So I got the help of, of a friend of mine who was also a swimming teacher and, uh, and then basically through that summer, I didn't do any run training, but I jumped into a couple of sprint triathlon races just to have some fun from the training that I did that I at that point still thought was just keeping aerobically fit for when I got back running. But then when I eventually got back running after nine months out, I actually had found that I enjoyed the variety of triathlon training so much that uh, I just was stuck with that. So basically from, from doing your first sprint triathlon in 2015, to win in your age group at 70.3 in three years that's a that's a pretty rapid progression from from total newbie to the sport with no swimming background as well let's point out that's that's pretty amazing michael yeah it's it's been rapid and it, it it's never felt like it but looking back <laughs> i i definitely agree and uh, but i got the same way as with running i i got really into the sport and really enjoyed it so the next year my first full triathlon year uh, which was 2016 i I started training uh, quite a lot more and uh, being very con- trying to be very consistent. I got a coach that year as well. And uh, Simon Briley, I want to give him a shout out. Uh, he might be listening to this in, in the UK. Uh, so, uh, so basically, so yeah, and I had the help of a lot of great people. Like I had my local swim coach that was a friend of mine. I, I had got a coach and, uh, and I was also like, I, I'm, trying to absorb knowledge i was reading a lot of books and knew a lot already from running i had been like studying the physiology of exercise science and and even coaching some runners so so i knew quite a bit of how to train effectively already from from that running background and obviously i had a an advantage of having done quite a bit of running already yeah so you've still taken and well you've taken yourself here from effectively being a non-swimmer you get into the water and you're swimming hundreds at 220 100 and i'm going to put some numbers on this for the listeners at 70.3 Portugal, uh, to win your age group, you, your splits were, I love the fact it was one second under 28 minutes. So 27.59 <laughs> on the swim, get in, 2.21 on the bike and 1.24 on the run. So 
you've taken yourself from the point of, you know, 220 per 100. A 28 minute swim at Ironman is something like it's like mid 120s per 100, is it? Something like that off the top high, of my head? High, high 120s, I think, like okay. 128 or something. Something like we'll, that. we'll give you mid 120s. How about that? <laughs> Too <laughs> modest. <laughs> so massive, massive increase in your swimming in, in what's like a three and a half year period. Let's talk about the training that's got you from obviously you're aerobically really fit already, but the skill acquisition part of it is something you've probably had to work really hard on. What did your swim training look like in that time to go from from there to here? Uh, well, I first started out with doing one session per week or per two weeks uh, at least with that coach and uh, and she uh, she gave me basically she told me what to work on technique wise but i also like when i first started before i got in 2016 in the winter of 2015-16 i actually used joe friel's book your best triathlon and used some programs from that so so i used sort of his um, structured workouts as well which was it wasn't any long, big swim workouts, really, but but I did a lot of hard intervals. Even when I was swimming, I was down at around two minutes per 100 by that time from technique improvement. So I was combining from the very start. I, I would say that I have combined hard swimming with technical improvements. I never had really a long period with just focusing on technique. I've already, always done quite a bit of hard work as well on the swim and uh, being really gassed. <laughs> Yeah, the runner's mindset right there, isn't it? Must work really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did your how did your progression work across the years? And can you roughly remember? So let's say we're swimming two twenties in twenty fifteen. How did it how did it kind of sequentially move forwards? Yeah, so two thousand sixteen. Oh, th- this is a very good question. I th- I think I was swimming probably towards the end of summer two thousand sixteen. I might have been doing like. I might have been at the 145 threshold pace or CSS test pace, yeah. something like that. And uh, 2017, maybe I was down to, at the end of the summer 2017, I might have been down to 135 or something. And and this year I've I've done a, I haven't done a lot of CSS tests. I did one recently that was 130, but that was off the back of not a lot of swim training recently. Uh, I've also had some problems actually with my swim training, even though it's been improving this year. But oh, yeah. I, I think that when I was swimming my best, which was in May this year, I did a 1458 1000 meter time trial. And I think that my CSS would probably have been in the like 128 or something like that. Got you. Yeah. So, so you've had that nice consistent improvement across time. How many How many times a week were you swimming then to see those improvements over the past three years? Over most of this period, it's been three to four times per week, I, I would say. And uh, and this year, especially in 2018, from from January through May, I was swimming a lot. Uh, I was doing, especially early winter, I was doing a lot of 20, 25k weeks with five to six swims per week because I was injured on on the run and partially on the bike as well. Uh, but now it's back to actually three times per week. So, uh, but three to four has been like a standard yeah. amount of swim. Yeah, so so you've really had to put the both the work and improving your technique in, but then I often think there's that kind of tipping point when you get to around one forty five, a hundred, you can kind of back off a little bit on the technique work, and then that's when the the ability to do hard work it's like you've fixed enough stroke flaws that they're not holding you back anymore, and you can really focus on the the, the fitness technique. And I think your your sort of natural hard work mindset's probably accelerated your development by putting that time in in the pool at that point onwards. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that, definitely. Yeah, 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 good. So talk about biking a little bit then. You, you said you bought a 300 euro bike back in the day and all of a sudden you're putting out a 221 bike split, which having compared you to the other guys around you, you weren't far off the fastest age group bike split of the day. You were only sort of five or six minutes behind the pro who the pro who won the race did a two fifteen on the bike. So you're an axe on the bike these days, man. So let's get into that. Let's talk about your bike training. Yeah. Uh, so, well, let's think. Well, first, the first half year or so before I got my coach in the, that full season, I, I did use that Joe Friel program. I did a lot. I was living in, living in Finland still at that at that time. So so I did a lot of training indoors on the indoor trainer, which I know that you are also a big proponent of. And I think that that has helped immensely to do a lot of hard work uh, on on the indoor trainer. Sort of that we actually just did an interview for for my podcast with you, and you talked about how you structured that. And and I've had 
kind of a similar approach uh, for myself on the bike with with a lot of like time effective training indoors on the on the turbo and uh, the same thing continued really with uh, uh, with when I got my coach we did still did but I I also got outside and tried to learn to learn the technical skills and and also how to be better positioned on the bike but but really my focus was for a long time on just the sprint and olympic distance so so i was still training mostly on on a road bike so so i wasn't really that focused on on aerodynamics more so on on power definitely when i got i actually didn't get a power meter until 2017 early 2017 so before that i was training more on sort of effort level and rpe yeah. Uh, so getting a power meter, that was that was invaluable. It, it really helps you train so much more effectively. I, I can't speak highly enough of having a power meter. Well, especially your your background is you're you're from a very scientific background, and in fact, your you know your website's title scientific triathlon. You've got an MSc, and so I was going to say getting the power meter was probably a real tipping point for you because all of a sudden everything can then be quantified analyzed you can see what training response produces what fitness gain that must have been massive for you yeah for for sure it, it was and uh i think that uh, when i was still in in helsinki and i got the power meter a lot of the training that that i was doing uh, we actually i actually used trainer road quite a bit and their program so so did quite a lot of sweet spot work but also threshold and vo2 max quite like a mixture really of different yeah. intensities but but quite a lot of intense work really that, that, yeah. that that's what it was like since moving to portugal i moved here to lisbon one year ago in october 2017 i've done i put in a lot more miles and i've actually improved a lot on the bike since moving here so so getting that base mileage in which i probably lacked before has also had a big impact and in terms of the intensities that i do now now i actually i live in a flat chair which is quite small i don't do a lot of training indoors if any uh, so, so I'm training a lot outside now, but I have some good places to do structured training outside still, and the weather is pretty nice. So, so I still do a lot of, a lot of the kind of sweet spot tempo work, but I've also included a bit more of the sort of low cadence work, especially now building into the 70.3, the, the muscular endurance and the, the strength work on the bike has, has been, been an important factor as well. Yeah, great. So let's talk a little bit about that. Cause I think it's interesting for the listeners to hear somebody having gone from, you know, I'm stuck indoors in Helsinki in the winter and I'm on the turbo trainer. You've just said you moved to Lisbon in Portugal where the weather's beautiful and I'm not jealous at all, mate. I'm not jealous at all of you having moved to the most beautiful training paradise in the world. <laughs> it, it, it is raining now. It, it's very great <laughs> and wet and cold. <laughs> well, that makes me feel a little bit better. Uh, how do you, how do you in, incorporate the structured training in an environment where you go outdoors to ride more of the time, talk us through what a typical workout might look for you when you're including, say, some sweet spot work into an outdoor ride. It, it's it's really all about finding a place to to do those reps. So so there are a couple of spots here that one that is very close that I can get to within ten minutes of riding through the city. It's sort of like a a, a road next to the airport that is uh, a straight like sort of. Uh, uphill small uphill and then a downhill but still not steep enough that you can't put in the effort on the downhill and and it's maybe if i go hard out and back it's like 10 minutes of riding yeah maybe something like that so i can do i can just go up and down that road and through the roundabouts at the ends and, and do the work then there's a slightly longer and probably i want to say better road to do the reps on but that's a bit further away it's like 40 45 minutes away from me so so to do reps there i have to do at least two hours to 15 on the bike which i do even on some weekdays these days so it's not as short workouts anymore because i have the flexibility with my coaching work and podcasting that i do a lot of work but i can choose when i do it so so i can do those longer rides and and that has been like i think that has been key actually that i get a lot of hours and a lot of kilometers in while i still have those structured workouts so so basically it forces me to do longer workouts and and get those kilometers in yeah, fantastic stuff. Well, let's also talk now a little bit about the fact you alluded to having moved from Helsinki to, to Portugal. Was that entirely based around looking for a better environment to train? Um, no, not entirely. It was, I decided, because I, as I mentioned, I was already into running coaching when I was running and, and doing that. And then pretty soon when I started triathlon and I started just learning everything I could learn about the sport and 
uh, I started blogging myself, but then I I sort of stopped blogging, but more more of started with the the podcast pretty soon, and then then I started uh, coaching as well. So uh, so basically, I found that I really loved coaching and I really loved podcasting and everything I was doing, but I didn't have time to be an engineer and uh, be a triathlon coach and be an athlete and. Uh, have uh, my social environment uh, etc in, in Helsinki something had to give so I decided to just that it was my engineering work that had to give and and then I was free to do the work from wherever I liked so yes training environment was a big aspect of where I wanted to move so I had a few options like Portugal Spain Italy but then it was the language people in Portugal are generally quite okay at English compared to to Spain for example so so that was one aspect also, there's a big community actually of so-called digital nomads here that work with anything and everything really, but work from their laptops, location independent. So, so there was this community of like-minded people, people here that I I could join outside of the triathlon community that I have. So, so that was another big draw. Nice. And tell us a little bit about your podcast. Then it's been going for about eighteen months now. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, something like that. So, so it's. Uh, it's a mixture of interviews and solo episodes and uh, basically with every episode like the one we just did with you i want to give the listener something useful information about training and uh, something applicable that they can do some of them are more technical some are less technical like and uh, more of sort of like just yeah actionable actionable advice sometimes i go deep and review some sort of scientific paper or a heap of them at one time and try to distill that into some sort of uh, conclusion and uh, talk about what that might mean for the training in practice. Like, for example, I did a, recently a couple of episodes on interval training and what sort of interval training seems to be more effective for improving VO2 max versus others so that we don't just choose interval durations and recoveries and modalities based on, you know, random things and what what is typically done, but actually based on what people have measured and researched and, and looked into from a scientific perspective. But then I'm the first to say that this scientific basis is only one part of the input to your decision making in whether you're coaching yourself or you are a coach coaching other athletes. I think the biggest one is still the the feedback from the athlete and what what you see, how they respond to training as a coach and, and your own experience as a coach, what you know is working. For example, we've been talking a lot about sweet spot training I don't know that there's any particular research about sweet spot training or that sort of intensity, but we still know that it seems to be working really, really well. So I use that a lot and uh, and I see that it's working. So I don't care that there's not a lot of research about it. And whereas there is research about VO2 max intervals, I still use both of them. I'm not going to give up on sweet spot training just because there isn't a scientific backing for it because I see that it works. And give us an example of what would be what would be one of your favorite bike workouts in the run up to 70.3 Portugal let's try and get some of the the secret sauce that got you to a 221 bike split yeah so this is uh, one that I got from my current coach uh, Andre Campos uh, who's a Portuguese coach uh, here in uh, my team uh, sporting and uh, so it's uh, basically it's a two-hour workout usually and it has a 40 minute main set in it where the first four minutes are at zone three intensity with uh, a cadence of 55 to 65 rpm then we go up to eight minutes, still at zone free intensity. Uh, so there's no recovery, uh, still zone free, but the cadence moves up by five, so 60 to 70. Then we move into low zone four uh, for 12 minutes, and that uh, would be still five RPM higher. So now we're at 65 to 75 RPM. And then finally, 16 minutes at higher zone four. Uh, so that would be right around threshold, uh, and that would be at 75 to, to 85 RPM. Wow, killer. So so you've tired your, your muscular force system out with pushing big gear at the start of it, and then you have to recruit more on your sort of your aerobic system, I guess, more heart yeah. muscles. That sounds like a hell session. <laughs> There's no well, yeah, it, it sounds it, it awful. 16 minutes at threshold at the end of that. It, it can be. And to be honest, like doing it on the trainer, I think it would be even worse, definitely. But doing it on the roads, I've been doing... You do have these short mini breaks when I go through roundabouts and I have to coast a little bit to wait for traffic, that sort of thing. So so for me, it's not as bad as it sounds like, but doing it on a trainer, I think it would be really, really difficult. But but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very useful one and it can be 
as hard as you make it really doing that uh, i set my 20 minute uh, power record for the year i actually set in that last 20 minutes of that 40 minute segment when i did this uh, this workout actually completely uphill or almost completely uphill one so so that was pretty cool and i had no idea i was doing that but but i was doing a 320 watt uh, 20 minute segment as part of uh, as the last 20 minutes of the segment when i was already very tired so i was happy with that nice it's, it's a beautiful time of year when you're at peak fitness and those numbers seem to come so easily isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. just it's doesn't it. happen very often yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to the 70.3 in portugal what's the experience like of being at the very front of an age group race firstly was it one of those was it a rolling start did you know where you were amongst the race or did your whole wave start together how did that play out it was a rolling start, so and I had had some swim problems, as I mentioned, like sort of almost like overtraining or non-functional overreaching, uh, yeah. some issues that I'm actually still still working on. I went to take some blood tests this morning, so okay. so so I've had some problems this year as well, even though my fitness was and is at an all-time high for sure. But so I was very conservative because the swim training I had been doing was very limited because the swim was where I suffered the most in training, really. So. So I started probably a few minutes after most of the really competitive guys in my age group. Uh, but uh, then basically getting out on the bike, I pretty quickly did. I had to do quite a lot of surging at the first 15 kilometers or so of the race. But then, then I find a good, a good rhythm and I saw the people around me. It was moving positions quite a bit, but I saw that at least a couple of them, if not three of them, were also in the same age group. So, so I had part of the front end of the race right around me at that point yeah and uh and then on the run i did i didn't know those guys but i didn't i didn't know if anybody else was in front of me and it should be said it was my first 7.3 i had as a goal that qual to qualify for next year's world championships but not in this race this was just to get experience see what the distance was like and then next spring i would use as my attempt to qualify for for worlds and start to move into the, the longer distance from the sprint and Olympic distance. So, so I was just trying to get the most out of myself with no performance expectations, really, which was a good place to be mentally, just enjoying the day. Yeah. And, yeah, and then, on, then on the run, I, I did see that a couple of those guys, I, I actually pulled away from, from that small little group that we had and, uh, and got into T2 first of all of us, but I still had no idea if anybody else was in front and i still don't know i haven't checked the results if somebody got there ahead of me but i was i knew that i was in a very good position both time wise and position wise heading on to the run then there were two or three people that they did catch up to me on the run pretty soon into it actually and and passed me i, I just held my pace i still was running a bit faster than i thought i could run so so i didn't go with them but but I kept that that steady pace and I managed to hold it throughout. It was very hard, but I managed to hold it. And it was a very hot day as well. So I think that that played a part in that. Probably the others didn't manage to hold their paces. They faded in the in the heat, and uh, and I could overtake them in the end. Yeah. So how has from from someone at the front end of the race? How do you feel that the rolling start affects the actual head to head racing thing? It sounds like there's quite a lot of uncertainty the whole time you're out there as to, to where things where things are, basically. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I had no idea, and I didn't know I won my age group until an hour after the race when uh, wow. somebody who I know randomly told me that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, because I, I didn't come into it with any, any sort of performance goals, really. So, so, yes, I mean, it was very difficult, and that's something that going into future 70.3 races with rolling starts, I need to, uh, like, especially going into 70.3 words, where I, want to have set some performance goals i don't know what that will be yet but yeah I, I will have to think about a way if there is a rolling start i don't yet know really how can can you get sort of information about where you are in the race because it, it is difficult and it it's sort of uh, yeah I, I was racing myself really i, I wasn't racing I, I was using other people for energy and trying to overtake people and get the best possible overall placement in the in the field but but i couldn't really i didn't really have any idea about the age group situation yeah one thing I wanted to ask you was, what's the driving force behind you doing triathlon? It, it's a good question. Like, I, I should be able to answer it. I, I just know that I want to see how how good I can become because I know, well, we talked about starting out swimming to 2100s, uh, cycling, you know, I was way behind in terms of 
being able to keep up with the old man strength guys, the 60 year olds in that group ride when I first started riding as cross training, running when I started running my first marathon, I did a 356. So I'm not like by nature a talented endurance athlete or anything. I, I want to see like how far hard work and smart, smart and hard work can get you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Cause I get the sense with you that you're, you're kind of experimenting on yourself, but you kind of, it's a really like a pure feeling of, I just want to see how good I can get. You're not, you're not driven by a competitive nature to race other people, or you don't want to get in a battle with someone necessarily. You're going to use the people around you to help you along, but it seems like you're driven by this ideal of seeing how good you can get yourself to be. Yeah, but but at this point, and it has been for a long time, really. But but at this point, I do also definitely have the goal of of trying to see if I can, for example, medal at some point. Not next year, I know that that will be way too soon for me. But I've been in the sport for just a few years still, so so there's plenty of years to come and keep improving. So so I do want to at some point probably fight for the medals at the age group level at the world championships in both 7.3 and and hopefully ironman as well so so i do i do use that competitive nature as well at this point but but it is it is about improving myself to see how how, where my potential is in relation to others in uh, others in the same situation not professional athletes but age groupers well, don't put limits on it, man. If you've won your age group in your first 70.3, who knows? Maybe you will be challenging for the medals at Nice next uh, next September. It will, well, it, it could be. Like, No, I'm not going to put any limits. That's definitely <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, that's a good piece of advice. I'm not going to do that. And, and my last question is going to be, it, I always come back to this because it's where my passion is. The thought of doing Ironman, where does that sit with you right now? I know that that's going to be my strongest distance because I'm I'm not a fast. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a fast athlete, but but I I do think that I have uh, I have very good mental resilience both for the training and the racing, which I think is needed for the Ironman uh, distance. And and I know that I have good endurance. When I was running, I had really good marathon times compared to my 5K times, for example. So 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 I know that that that's going to be something that can suit me. And also, I think that the uh, the analytical side of things, getting the most out of your training, it's going to be even more valuable as you as you get into the longer distance and really making sure that you tick all the boxes and, and get the most out of your training and also things like recovery, nutrition, etc. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, listen, and just finally tell us, we obviously touched on your, your website and your podcast, but just tell us a little bit about how people can get in touch with you and find out more about you if they like what they've heard today, Michael. Yeah, so so the best way I think is is the podcast for sure, like that triathlon show on any of your podcast apps, and you can also find it on the website, which which is scientifictriathlon.com. So and the, I have the podcast there, and I I have some some other information. I have information about my coaching, and uh, that sort of thing. So so check it out on on those two platforms, the website and the podcast. Awesome stuff. So listen, thank you very much for taking the time to come and join us. We we wish you all the best. And I'll be looking at the results in Nice next summer with uh, with interest to see. I think you're going to be a bit higher up those results than you think you're going to be at the moment. So it remains to be seen. <laughs> let's, let's hope so. Let's hope so. And I feel the pressure of having all your listeners as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I didn't mean to heat pressure on you, but there you go. There it exists now. <laughs> all right, Michael, listen, thank you very much for your time. We'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, Robbie. It was brilliant to to be on and talk. Love hearing these stories of people who buckle down, work really hard, and then and then give great examples of, you know, I was swimming 220 per 100, and now he's doing a sub-28 minute swim. So it's it's inspirational for people, I think, to hear these stories of people who've made very quick advancements in the sport to show what can be done if you apply yourself. I like his uh, 221 bike split, Rob. I know, it's you know, when Blimey. when the winning pro only goes two fifteen. And it was on a road bike as well, he told me afterwards. So <laughs> there's a bit of free speed to be had there as well, I think. Wow, that is yeah. nuts. You could go and have a go and um see Phil Burt, who um who who was talking at the Training Peaks conference as well. Very knowledgeable guy when it comes to bikes. Bike fitting chap, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. All right, jump in. Coach's Couch this week. Uh, This week, we're going to be talking about the intelligent use of intensity on the bike in winter training. Yeah, right. So you're often going on about um, getting triathletes to do hard intervals on the bike during winter. So why do you go with that method rather than 
sort of, I guess, the more traditional, long, slow base miles. Okay, so I know it's a little bit of, a, sort of contention here in the in the realms of going against the book, but anyone who's tried to do lots of long, slow miles over the winter can know it's it's going to be a real challenge with things like heading out to train in the dark, getting soaked and freezing partway through your long ride. And I think the big challenge is how many athletes miss their winter rides because the weather's just too bad. So this whole focus came around because it's an approach to try and make the best use of the time that athletes have got. Most athletes don't have loads of time to train. They can't actually make a lot of use of the time. They do have to train during the winter because of the weather and things like that. So I thought, right, let's try and use the winter to to build bike power and see if that translates to outdoor fitness. And the great news is it really does. It eliminates the external factors like the weather, the temperature, the darkness. You can just get yourself indoors on the turbo trainer. It's all really controllable and you can hammer yourself and get really good gains while, you know, not necessarily your friends, but that other you who might have tried a different method of training is either not doing that training because of the weather or trying to do it and not being very successful. So what we're going to have you do is we're going to prioritize sessions indoors that take no more than an hour. We're going to include 30 to 40 minutes of really high quality, high intensity work on the bike. If you've got a power meter, it's going to be working at functional threshold. If you haven't, that's okay. You can use a heart rate monitor or you can even actually just use a speedo that measures the speed of your back wheel. And that's going to allow you to make sure the power is transferable from session to session. Now, the good news is it's very effective. The slightly not so good news is it is going to be extremely hard and extremely taxing. So you're going to have to be ready to grit your teeth and get through it. But you'll find that your aerobic fitness will skyrocket over the winter and you'll be amazed that come springtime, what will happen is you'll go out and ride with your buddies who haven't trained like this and they won't be able to stay with you anymore. You're going to be going two or three kilometers an hour faster come the springtime while everyone else has either stagnated or gone backwards during the winter. So what we've traditionally seen within the athletes we coach is a, a power jump of sort of six to eight percent in an eight week block, which may not sound massive, but if you can do two of those eight week blocks over winter, that's a significant jump in performance in terms of how fast you'll be riding on the road come the springtime. And there we go. That it, that's it. There we go. That it, wow. Well, it definitely um it's definitely worked for me previously and um especially you've got to be prepared to do it haven't you that's the thing you've got to be yeah like athletes but if you like you it... who are prepared to put the work in get really good results so that's the caveat i think if you have it in an actual plan and it sort of appears um like we've spoken a lot about this before about having you know a, an actual structured session then then totally. you can do it yeah whereas if you don't then it makes it really, really difficult. And it's very easy to just sort of sit on a turbo, isn't it? And, and move the legs, but not yeah. really get a whole load out of it. Well, there's two things there as well. I think that like, first up, if you do just try and get on the turbo and you've got no structure to it, you're going to get bored really quickly and you'll get off. But if you have got something written down, even if it's just you as a person having decided what you're going to do before you get off, then the time goes really quickly. You get your tunes on and you decide you're going to do, you know, four reps of five minutes or whatever once you've set your brain to do that you've got a goal to reach before you finish whereas i think if you just try and ride once your bum starts to get sore you think yeah I've had you're off this, thank you yeah that'll do get it inside I'll, I'll just do half an hour and we've all yeah. done it i know i'm guilty of this i just go oh actually i just do half an hour today rather than an hour and you get off whereas if that session's in front of you or even better these days if it's in zwift then you've got little targets coming towards you on the screen you have to get it done to get your little little star don't you yeah yeah yeah. no so i I think it's i think rob if we lived in you know if if you lived in like a warm climate year round or whatever then it would be easier wouldn't it to get those base miles in if if you wanted to go down that approach but um in the uk in you know in the northern hemisphere uh we we don't it's pretty horrible outside on you know come the thick of winter and it can be quite miserable so um yeah at least (laughs) the pain's over more quickly yeah, exactly. And then it has this added benefit that you get into spring when the weather starts to get nicer. You're much fitter than you were when the winter started. And as you transition to riding outdoors, when the nights are or when the days are longer and there is more daylight hours available, you can then go out and do those base miles in inverted commas, those longer, more steady aerobic miles. Then 
closer to your goal 70.3 or Ironman. It's much more specific training to do that closer to your goal race. And you're going to be covering those miles faster because you're fitter. So it's a no brainer, except for the fact, you know, your buddies will all be trying to grit the teeth to hang on to you. So yeah. that's the only downside, the feeling of like dropping all your mates every time the road goes uphill. Oh, yeah. But then there, there, there's no downside. That's not really a downside, is it? Everyone loves no. handing out the hurt bucket. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll jump over and have a look at some of the news we've seen from around the world. Um, the first thing that I noticed is Yorkshire Man is going to happen next year. Yeah, so it's going to be a full iron distance race. Um, and it's obviously going to be up in Yorkshire, so Newby Hall. Now, I've done a half distance at Newby Hall. And what Great I venue, can tell you, it? it's a really, really good venue. I remember the river being, I remember the river being quite dark, but it was... It was quite nice. I'm sure you swam a little bit downstream and then a tiny bit upstream or something like that. Um, and then the bike was the bit that they took us was, um, I remember it being pretty flat indeed. Um, so yeah, it says my, mildly undulating. Mildly undulating. Yeah. Bear in mind though, this is Yorkshire, so that might mean you go up the north face of the Eiger. If a Yorkshire yeah. written, it's mildly undulating. There's... Exactly. There's a good few climbs on that route from what I can see. I don't think, yeah, the, I don't think it's going course, to be flat. <laughs> no, I think the, the bit no. that would have been um, flat is probably, um, for, for the race I did up there, is probably the bit of the course profile that, you know, is the flat bit before the hills. Yeah, got you. Yeah, we didn't go out into the dales. Uh, the run, though, was, um, I do remember that being very much pancake flat. Um, and oh, it does bonus, say, isn't it? yeah, it's held in the grounds of Newby Hall, which is really, really nice, and in the local village as well. So, um, yeah, good surfaces, four laps, and each time you go through the event uh, village. And, Rob, it's run by a company called Freebird Events. Now, I have done, they're the ones behind, um, I want to say Sundowner. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and that was really, again, really, really good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, that's another, I think that makes, oh, what did I see earlier on? There was like seven iron distance races in the UK next year now, which is quite mind blowing, isn't it? When you think back to when I kicked off and there was only, there was only one iron distance race in the UK and that wasn't even a branded one. So the fact there's now seven to choose from. And I think this course looks great. I think there's going to be a good mix of, you know, faster, flatter roads around the area, but also some hills to break it up. I think it's it's going to be a nice mix. That's it. Yep. So check doing a that half out as then. well. They're doing half on the same day, are they? I hadn't seen that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. On the on their website. Um, so yeah, both races Sunday the twenty third of June, and uh, the Sundowner one, Rob, which they run, is the thirty first of August. Nice. If you're interested in that? So check that out over at Freebird Events, and then another event that I've seen. Um, the organizer Darren sent us an email about this a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember us talking about Ultraman? We had Ultraman world champion Rob Gray on. Yes, yes. Now, distance-wise, I can't remember. What What are the distances? Oh, it's well, first up, it's a three-day event, right? So it starts with a 10K swim on the first day. Yeah. You know, so just a 10K swim. Um, in fact, before we before we say this, what the distances are, we should say there's going to be one in the UK next year. This is what we're going to be talking about. Old or UM UK. I don't think it's an officially branded Ultraman. Looking at the website, it says Ultraman Distance. So altogether, held it's 515 kilometres of racing over the over the three days. So day one, 10k swim. Day two, oh sorry, sorry. You missed, day one, yeah, you missed a key thing. Followed there. by 90 <laughs> miles on the bike, as you do. Yeah. Day two is 172 miles on the bike, and day three is a 52.4 mile double marathon. Blimey. And it's all based around Betsy Coed in North Wales. So, ain't going to be flat. Some decent terrain for you to run and ride around there. And the swim is in uh, Bala, isn't it? Yeah, Bala Lake. Oof. You know what, Rob? I did I did see that, and I thought, as in, I, I just saw it um, when you when we sort of looked at the link. Don't and I was say like, it. Don't oh say yeah, it. that. Do you fancy it? No, I, what, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not oh, going to okay. do it. But I did think, I don't know. I sort of thought, oh, that, that sounds doable. But then, then the uh, 52 mile double marathon run on the third mm. day, I think I thought, no, really. Like, <laughs> that's steady a, on. 
yeah, yeah, that bit was a steady on moment. Woof. Yeah, so there's a, a few other way, different events it? going on there as well over the weekend. So check it out. The, uh, the website is racingquest.co.uk. So if you fancy a bit of Ultraman action, um, Ultraman distance action, I should say, before we get a lawyer's phone call, um, <laughs> check that out over yeah. at racingquest.co.uk. And the last bit of news I've seen, Hells, I, this is just mind blowing. Have you seen this story about the Japanese marathon runner who yeah. fractured her leg in yeah. the Fukuoka relay team? Yeah, I did see this. Um, Ray Leader, so uh, yeah, 19 years old, 200 yards left to go of her race, and um, she basically crawled it. She's and, she didn't want to let her yeah. teammate down. It's a two teammate. and a half mile relay race isn't it for them to mm. to do a full marathon distance with 200 yards to go she tripped fell turns out afterwards when they looked at her she'd broken a leg so she crawls on her hands and knees for 200 yards to get to the finish line <sighs> ray yeah, we salute you you legend yeah. of endurance oh i don't think i don't think i'd be doing that but um it, it did remind me of the uh crawling across the finish line moments at i am on hawaii yeah it's just amazing isn't it yeah, how far you'd go. You don't want to let your teammates down. It's like Rich, wasn't it, in the relay that we did at Outlaw? Yeah. Carried on, didn't he? Got back on his bike. After crashing, yeah. Bless After his him. car crash. Bless him. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. All right, well, that's just about everything from this week's show. We can wrap that up here. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. Um, you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. With thanks again to our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. Remember, you can use the code Oxygen Addict for £9.99's worth of free product on the uh, precisionhydration.com website. And also, if you want to check out our uh, free training webinar for training for 70.3 and Ironman Distance Triathlon, you can use the link in the show notes. Team Oxygen Addict is currently closed because we've had loads of new members come in recently, so we're just getting them onboarded. So as a thank you for watching the webinar, if you watch the whole thing, we're giving away a free four-week winter training plan. So the kind of bike training stuff that we talked about there, we can give you a taste of what those sessions feel like within the free four-week training plan. So just use the link in the show notes. So yeah, until next week, I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great, safe training and racing week, and we'll speak to you again soon. Cheers, everyone. See ya. Bye.